Welcome everyone to the latest webinar from Hired Power. You are tuning in today for our webinar, Tips and Tricks for a Healthy Family Holiday. We are here today with Nanette Zumwalt, our President and CEO of Hired Power. She is currently recognized as one of the top interventionists and industry experts in the country and even internationally. She began working in the field of mental health nearly three decades ago and Nanette is on every board and part of all the programs out there and she is a wealth of knowledge. So I'm really excited to hear from her today. And then we are very excited for our special guests, Adam and Terry. Terry is mom and um, Adam is her son and they are going to be sharing their own story today about you know, how they've navigated the complex dynamics of family and the holidays and addictions. And hopefully we'll provide all of you with some tips and tricks to, to get through this family season. So without further ado, I will hand this over for, to Nanette. Good morning. Thank you all for, for being here with us this morning. So um, I'm excited to be doing this with two very good friends of mine. Uh, both Terry and Adam. I have known and worked with them in the community. They're large community advocates who have made themselves readily available for not just individuals who are struggling, but for the family members who are seeking advice, comfort, and information. So they're well known in our community. I'm happy to introduce them to all of you so you can know them as well. They are a, a very powerful family, um, solid in recovery, solid in goodness, and just a pleasure to know. So thank you both for, for being willing to be here with, with us this morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. So Adam, I wanna start with you. You've got 11 years in recovery. Um, as, as you share yourself, it's been a, a long journey and um, so how's life for you today? How, is, how are things in relationship with your family? Yeah, uh, life is busy, um, probably more than I, uh, I've been off probably more than I can chew. Uh, I have a wife, I got a, a gonna be a four year old and then I have a seven month old. And uh, yeah, life is like in full effect. 11 years ago, I was just, didn't really have anything really. Um, and, uh, I just didn't really envision this for myself. I, I would picture people, I would look at people who had like a family and a house and a car and job. And I had like no idea how people got there. And, um, you know, as like a, a young addict alcoholic, it just, it didn't seem like a reality for me. Um, relationships now, um, with my parents, I think it's the best it's ever been. Um, Obviously, there's still stuff that comes up, um, but sobriety obviously has been number one. I always tell family, you know, when they ask me, what can I do to help this situation? It's like so sobriety is number one. If I wasn't sober, none of this would be possible. Um, and then um, just being open to being open, you know, like I can get very hard headed or set in my ways. Um, I can get very, you know, stuck in what I'm doing. And, you know, my wife tells me I'm a Taurus. And so I'm like very like hard headed and I don't want to listen to what everyone else is telling me. And so I try to be as open minded as I can when people are saying, you know, like your behavior is out of line or something you said upset me, something that you said hurt my feelings. And make sure that I change my behavior so I don't hurt their feelings again. Yeah. And it's been a journey with your family. You shared with us earlier that, you know, there's no quick fix, right? In relationships. Mm -hmm. And it took time. It took time for things to really settle with your family. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, technically I've, I've really grown up and I told you guys earlier, like uh, I started using when I was 15, 16 years old. So when I got sober at 22, I really was, I considered myself like 15 years old, just my emotional skills, uh, just handling, you know, life on a day-to-day -day basis. I was still like 15 or 16 years old as a 22 year old. And so I, I really over the past 11 years have like really grown up and some of, some of it's been sped up because, um, you know, my behaviors in one way is like, th there'll be consequences to that. And so 
you know, I've, 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 there's some years where I've grown up faster than a normal person would grow up, but, um, yeah, it, it wasn't like an overnight process. Uh, I struggled probably for the first five years, you know, especially with relationship with my family, it was just uncomfortable. And, um, you know, I had a sponsor and, and I did the steps, but I still was, uh, very, very uncomfortable. You know, there obviously we have a big family, there's six of us. And so there's a huge family dynamic. I have three sisters, so everyone's got an opinion. Um, everyone's got an opinion that matters and that should be accounted for. Um, and so, yeah, it hasn't been easy, but, um, I always tell families like, don't ever give up. It's so easy nowadays to, you know, just like cancel a family member and just cut them off and stop talking to them. I see that all the time. Um, and, uh, I, I just always like, don't ever give up on my family members and, I always want to keep that line of communication open. And I always think that I can, I can look at my part in things and change my behavior. That's so great, Adam. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Terry, what was the, what was the deciding factor? You know, you guys, your family entered into recovery and, and the amazing thing about your family is it has been a family recovery journey. It's not just been a journey for Adam but you're an active member in recovery. Your family's very active in recovery. So what was the deciding moment? How did you and your husband reach the, the decision to, to make that first step? I, I, I searched my head about it because I can picture following my girlfriend who had a son who was using as well into a meeting. I can picture a ponytail as we're going into the eight o'clock uh, Saturday morning parents meeting, which just goes off. And I can't tell you how I got in that room and I imagine someone suggested it and I'm going to say it was while he was in treatment at Capstone. That's 13 years ago and people weren't talking about going to meetings still. They just weren't, not even at treatment centers and it was suggested that you might want to go to an Al-Anon meeting. So I found myself in there. And um, I may have entered the room because of what was going on with Adam, but I stayed for me. And, and explain that. What does that mean? Um, I love meetings. I love them. I love, I love when people share because it's a passive way of seeing what I do, what my character defects are without even opening my mouth. Um, I did a lot of crying in those early years. That was really my only way of communicating. And I would, could listen to someone share and, and I could hear it and I could say, oh, I do that. Is that what that sounds like when I say that? Oh my gosh, that happened in my family of origin. I've seen that in my husband's family. We do that. And there was a commonality that had never occurred to me up until the point I entered a meeting. That's amazing. And so if we back that up, how did it come to pass for Adam to end up in treatment? How did your family get to that point? And where, where did you find the resources? It's fascinating. Um, he was a garnered athlete and he started burning it down and it just did not make sense to me. There was no way someone that gifted and with all those different positive things happening in his life that it could be going this poorly. And I started researching on the internet and reaching out to different places and no one would take a kid. That was back in the day. I finally found a place in Texas who referred me to Capstone. And then I probably spent close to a year praying about that. And after Adam burned the last piece down, we pitched it to him and he was really willing to go at that point. Yeah. And knowing there's so many more resources now, right, that weren't there 13 years ago. Yes. Families that call you, and I know that you have those families that are calling you all the time. What is the first step if they're unsure um, about what do I do? You know, my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, my, my aunt, my uncle, my grandmother, um, this is happening in our life and I don't know where to go. What are, what are you recommending for them? What resources are you putting out there for them? I have a kind of a one-two punch. I speak to the humiliation point. 
of what it's like to be a parent that doesn't have the answers their son or daughter needs and the way I am loving them, the way I loved Adam was killing him. I lead with that, which more times than not, the parent or person who has called me starts crying. And then I say, you can call my son. He works in the treatment interest industry. You can call me any hour of the day. I will give him the different, them the different meetings to go to. I encourage them to um, get an interventionist. Um, I beg them to go start going to meetings and get a sponsor. Walk in, find somebody you, who has what you don't have and what you want and pick them as your sponsor. It's that simple. Yeah. That is such a powerful statement. It actually brings tears to my eyes. The way I'm loving my loved one is killing them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those of us who are in recovery, but also those of us who are family members of recovery, we can look at that and actually see the truth of, we just don't know what we don't know. And the best of what we have isn't enough for our child or our spouse for our parent. And so the way we're bringing solution to the table, they're still slowly dying. And that's such a powerful statement um, and such a difficult thing to realize that we can't always be the solution or the fix or have the right answers and that we do need to reach out to professionals. So I love the community you know, community resources that you're offering. Um, I also want to encourage people to reach out to professional resources. You know, SAMHSA.org is a national um, database of professionals. There's interventionists, case managers, local hospitals. There's a lot of resources. And one of the things Terry and I spoke about um, before this is we wanted to make sure that people did this research and had these resources in their pocket before they walked into Thanksgiving dinner, before they walked into Christmas Eve. Because when things burn down in the middle of a Thanksgiving dinner, it's hard, it's hard to know who to call or who to ask for help. And it's often, oftentimes not a lot of our friends are answering the phone on Thanksgiving. They're busy with their own families. A lot of our regular resources aren't going to be available to us because they're busy. So having that phone number in the pocket of who is my safe person or who is my safe resource to call is going to be very important going into this holiday season. Adam, what was like, what was that like for you when your parents decided it, it, it was time for you to go to treatment? What did that look like for you? Yeah, they were like, they didn't give me like an ultimatum. Um, I was at UCLA and they came at winter break and I remember uh, my dad sat me in his car and they told me that they had like a place for me to go and I wasn't really done yet. Um, and uh, I thought that I kind of still had a grip on things or like turn it around. And then uh, that was in December. And then by the time June came, I had uh, gotten kicked off the team. And really when I, I think when I got kicked off the team, they like, they knew I was that kind of put the nail in the coffin and, um yeah I was ready I was like super ready um I I've kind of always been the guy I'm like either in it or I'm, or I'm not in it like if if I want to be sober I'm fully in it um if I don't want to be sober you know I'm uh, I'm not gonna like waste people's time um obviously not everyone's like that but yeah I, I was ready I was like full on ready to go I wanted to get I was the kid who like I didn't fight going into residential I was I didn't I wanted them to take away my phone I didn't want to talk to anybody no one really wanted to talk to me and so yeah I was I didn't really fight it there at the end and those families that are struggling saying you know I don't want my loved one to be gone for Christmas or I don't want my loved one to be gone for Thanksgiving all their cousins are coming in town all their grandma and grandpa are going to be here and it's really important that he or she is here for that, what advice would you give? Would you give that family? Yeah, I always ask people, kind of like, if you're honest with yourself, what what are your motivations for that? You know, is and most often the motivation for that statement is they don't want to be embarrassed that their loved one is in treatment during the holidays, right? Like they want to have the 
the Christmas card out with everything looks perfect. And, and, you know, I could think kind of that's how like our family was, is like everything on the outside looked pretty good. Um, but on the inside, you know, like I had my struggles and obviously that affected everybody else. Um, and I would just, you know, say, just be honest with yourself, you know, like, cause at the end of the day, really, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, say something happens to your loved one where, where they, they, you know, overdose or something, you know, they drive drunk and something happens and they die. We're going to be here looking back and say, you know, the only reason we didn't put, you know, this guy in treatment was because we wanted him home for the ho- for the holidays. And I'm like, you know, you look at back at that statement and I'm like, it, it's not really worth it, you know? And, and these days that can happen just at the, you know, like that. So people are passing away left and right. And so I just always tell people like, just be honest with yourself. And if something did, bad did happen, you just don't want to look back and, and say, you know, the reason I didn't want to save my loved one's life is because I wanted them to be there for that day on Christmas. So you're, you're helping them see the difference between their wants and their loved one's needs. Their loved yeah. one needs to be in a safe environment. Their loved one needs something different, although they may want what their version is of a, of a happy Thanksgiving or a happy thing or a happy Christmas. But I also talk to families and say, tell me about last Thanksgiving or tell me about last <laughs> Christmas. Was yeah. it the Christmas card? Was it the <laughs> Christmas card moment? You know, what's the truth about what the last holiday, was it Halloween? Was it 4th of July? You know, yeah. and what did that truly look like for your family versus what you want it? Because we all want those things very badly, right? We yeah. want our families to be healthy. We want our families to be happy. We want to spend time together. But the difference between our needs and our, our wants and our loved ones' needs need to be brought to awareness. So what was that like for you, Terry? I know you said that first Christmas was so difficult not having Adam present, but how did you get through it? How did you, how did you guys successfully maneuver that? I think when you asked me the question, when we were talking yesterday, you were going to ask me about the first Christmas he was home. Yeah. I have no memory of that. And what shot to my mind was the first Christmas he was gone in treatment and how painful that was. And you talk about what Adam will miss if he's not here. And to be perfectly honest, that's not an honest statement on behalf of the loved one. It, it's what we're going to miss with our person who isn't sober, regardless of his sobriety or not. We love them desperately we're six here. We're now 16 total. If one of us is missing, it's a real deal. We're like all in, we're super teamy. We're athletes. It's let's do this thing. And we don't work independently very, we don't, we just don't. And so for him to be gone, I can picture cousins coming over. We're waiting for the phone call from the treatment center. We're just all geared up for that because we don't do well when one of us is spinning out of control. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that was a hard Christmas and it was the right thing and the hard thing, but, and that was the same, they were the same things. And And did you lean on each other? Did you lean on outside resources? I was already, did you guys lean on to get through that? I was already in meetings. I had a sponsor in Al-Anon, a sponsor in CODA. I was working my steps. Um, taking, you know, taking my own inventory and really seeing what my side of the street was. Um, Those were very hard years. There is a lot of crying, a lot of pain, a lot of regret, a lot of, um, uh, oh my gosh, my, my ninth step to Adam was probably like a dictionary of things that I, I was, I felt I was so sorry for that. I didn't even know the way I loved him. I didn't even know that that was contributing to his um, acting out and, and coming to those realizations was terribly painful. And it was the right thing and the best thing that's ever happened to him and me as a mother and son. Can you give us an example, and and maybe I'll ask Adam too, um, from his perspective, but what was an example of the way, I I 
enabling is a hard word for me because I agree with you. It's enabling is over loving, right? It's because we care and we love so much that we get enmeshed and we enable. So what was a way in which your support or your and your husband's support was continuing to allow Adam to remain sick? When he was younger, it was as silly as mom, I'm at the back of my car and I've locked my gym shoes in the trunk and you come bring me the extra set of keys. Letting those play, those things play out in his life. Um, I was a latchkey kid growing up. My mom worked, my dad had left. No kid on my watch was not going to have his tennis shoes at practice. Right. There would be my jumping off point. Yeah. You were a parent at the age of five. Yes. So down the road, when um, things got real in college, I can picture his car has been towed. He's probably hung over. His dad and I are waiting outside. We're trying to get the car out of tow. And he picks up the phone like, what do you want? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going, um, yeah, that and those kinds of things. That's when I started over functioning, coming up and cleaning his dorm up for him after he'd he'd done this or that and la 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 and blah blah blah. Those kinds of things. That's right. when it that's when I went off the rails. Right. And and how did you see that, Adam? How was that? Where did you see your family really? You know, your mom gave us just gave us some great examples. And I know for a lot of parents, they're in their head right now going, oh, I see me. That was me. That is me. Yeah, they I mean, they never like they never enabled my my drinking or using like it was always there was consequences from the first time I drink. Um, So but yeah, they're they're probably stuff where I should have like felt things harder they rescued me um which you know I think it has its good uh points and its bad points but yeah there were times that was just like I have you have like a million of those stories of where I just did stuff out of stupidity and instead of like feeling the actual consequence you know my mom you know rescued me and uh I mean, at the end, it, it was, my dad was like, no, you're done. And, and I felt every consequence that I needed to feel to get sober. But um, yeah, I think um, she probably swooped in when she probably shouldn't have swooped in. Yeah. Coming from a place of love, over loving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when you came home from, from Capstones, when you were leaving treatment, how did... How were, how were you and your family prepared for life on life's terms? What would you say is the most important thing or the most important tool you came home um, with to, to start your recovery journey in the community? Yeah, yeah. So um, I actually went to Capstone twice. The first time I didn't do any aftercare. Um, and I think that is like, obviously, I think, detox and residential is amazing I think that first 30 days is or 30 60 90 days is like amazing to just get the drugs and alcohol out of the the kids system to uh kind of start the healing of the brain but I think the aftercare portion is the biggest that first like that two years that first two years is like so crucial to be um if in my perfect world and you know obviously finances are a thing and insurance and all this stuff and if there is that available to you I think aftercare is like the best uh option for someone to at least get to a year sober um I think if someone can be in a program uh or structured sober living for that first year their chances of staying sober like long term are like through the roof um and so I did like 90 days at caps on the first time I came like right back home. Um, I did not do well. Uh, I was like sober kind of, but, uh, I like didn't do well. They didn't really set us up with, and this was like 13 years ago. So there wasn't like PHP IOP with structured sober living or, you know, sober living with, you know, case managers and sober companions that that like that stuff wasn't around um 
And so I came back home pretty much like right back into the system I was in. I worked for my dad every day. I think I called out sick like three times a week. Um, and I slept in like sleeping is, you know, my like third or fourth drug of choice. You know, like if I get anxious or if I get depressed, like you'll find me sleeping all the time. Um, with luckily like a, a baby, a newborn now, I don't ever get to do that, but, um, I just like slept pretty much like slept whenever I could my, my, that first year. And then, uh, I ended up going back to Arkansas and then, um, uh, I did, I did, uh, Chico's sober living after the second time. And I did like much, much better, but that first year was, was really rough. And so I highly suggest aftercare, sober living therapy, um, kind of all that. In, all in those order. community resources and community yeah. support. And how important was it for you? I mean, I know how important it is for the family to enter recovery um, mm -hmm. and to join and look, you know, your Terry just shared, your mom just shared about having to look in the mirror and having to look at some of her own um, learned behaviors. You know, she was parentified at the age of five. She, she grew up doing the best she could with what she knew. And yeah. so, you know, how important was it to your recovery for your family to enter their journey of recovery? Yeah, so I think uh, once my mom kind of went into Al-Anon and she stopped, like, I call it the dance of where, like, uh, I would do something, like, she talked about, like, the car, I would, like, go out, have a crazy night, like, I stole my sister's car, I uh, parked it somewhere, obviously, UCLA parking's insane. I got it towed and then like my mom's there and I think my oldest sister was there too to like any I, I like went off to treatment and they they handled it like none of my money was paid like not that I had any money at that time but like you know it was just like completely like put in a box for me wrapped it up like and shipped off you know and so um my mom like essentially stopped doing that like uh the last time I relapsed they cut me off I had a truck that was under their name. They came and got the truck. They sold the truck. Um, they cut me off on their phone bill. And I like I had health insurance under their name, but that was it. And uh, it was very apparent, like very fast, that like the dance that I had done previously with them, where I was like getting loaded, they were rescuing me, they were paying for everything. Um, I remember like I thought like I had relapsed and I was like going back into treatment. They were like, no, you're like on your own. And I, and that, that was like, that saved my life. You know, that was the best thing they could have done for me. And, um, you know, they gave me resources. They had me call Chico. I called Chico right away. Um, and you know, I, I had to do like a little more, uh, drinking and using until I was finally done. But yeah, I, I think them, getting into recovery and, you know, getting sponsors and, and kind of like changing the dance or stop doing the dance, like saved my life. Yeah. And Terry, I mean, for your own sanity, one of the things I think Adam said earlier from, from his point of view, um, prior to us getting on this call is that families can get well, regardless of if their loved one chooses to get well. Um, how important was your own recovery journey to to, to your happiness and to the happiness of, you know, you have three other children, you have a spouse, you have, you know, other important members of your family. And when one of our family members are sick and are suffering, they are 90% and the rest of the world is 10%. And so how did you find balance and how important was finding balance to your own well being and to the well being of the rest of people who loved you and needed you? I love that you asked that question because um, you know how he spoke to you when he came back the first time and he just came back to our house, back to that humility piece, a mother and father, of course, he's coming back to our house. Mm -hmm. We're family. We're going to love him. We're going to keep him safe. Well, he can't get well where he got sick. So his aftercare piece is dead on. And it took Scott and I a long time to relinquish that, um, swallow that big, heavy bite of humility, humiliation. It was all enmeshed. You couldn't make heads or tails of it, but 
I had a group of women that I met with every Monday. We all had sons or daughters in treatment and we would just sit there and cry. And over time we started getting better and enjoying each other's company. And I know in a lot of Al-Anon meetings, you, you make friends in there and you start doing things with people who have similar stories because mm -hmm. it is very hard to, to hang out with civilians is the best way I can describe them. And then moving forward, the kids would say to me, the other three kids, let's, let's say when Adam went back out after the second time, um, mom, if you're going to come up and do that thing you do, which is don't talk because you're so upset, please don't come. And then I had to make a decision. Can I pull it together? Can I put on a, can I get it? Can I pull it together here for my other three? Um, and my husband, and those, those were hard days, a lot of talking with sponsors, a lot of meetings, um, double winners in Al-Anon meetings are my jam because they give me both perspectives and I learned so much from them. And so you're talking about a double winner is someone who's in recovery themselves, who has been through the journey and is also participating in an Al-Anon or a CODA meeting. That's what they're calling a double winner. So yes. Yeah. Those are your best, those are your best resources, your best tools. Those in open AA meetings, Adam would take me when he was getting a chip sometimes. And I, I'm all about it because stuff is real in there and it's safe and people are telling their truths. And I love when things are real and honest. There is a safety that I did not enjoy growing up because there was very little truth spoken in our house. And so I feel very safe in meetings. And it's important that you say an open meeting for people who aren't part of a 12 step community. It's important to know an open meeting means you, you don't have to be on a recovery journey yourself. You don't have to be struggling with drugs or alcohol to attend a meeting. An open meeting is welcome to people to come in and learn and experience what AA has to offer. A closed meeting, is those that are just for people struggling um, to get sober and to get well. So it's, I think it's an important thing that we mention because as you said, you found yourself in a few closed meetings and luckily the people were gracious enough not to, you know, not to embarrass or, or send you out. But it's important when we're looking for resources and, and you know, AA isn't our only community-based resources. There's smart recovery. There's refuge recovery that has a Buddhist. There's um, faith-based recovery meetings. Churches, our local churches have so many resources based in recovery, based in mental health wellness. And there's a lot of people, a lot of families where addiction is secondary to mental health. So the mental health association in your community or the national alliance for the mentally ill in your community are great resources. So we're talking a lot about 12 steps because that's the journey and the path you took. But I wanna make sure we're letting families know that it's a great safe place to start. It's a great safe place to meet people who have done a lot of research and have a lot of experience and can offer a lot of um, solid information, but there's other, other support networks out there as well. Yes. Yep. And uh, Adam, I was talking to Nanette and I remembered after Capstone, they wanted you to go to an AA meeting. So I went to that closed AA meeting with you and uh -huh. that gentleman sitting across from us. And I'm sure he was going, well, this is just the perfect storm right here in front of me. Yeah. And he was so compassionate and loving and graceful in that meeting. That was incredible. Looking yeah. back. And trying to figure out how to send you out of the meeting gracefully. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so working in recovery, Adam, now, what other resources do you refer families to? I mean, I just went through kind of a litany list, but. Did yeah, you... yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I, I'm big on community too. I obviously like I'm an AA guy. I'm, I refer a lot of people to my mom for Al-Anon. Um, I'm like, big on um, if the client's not willing or the loved one's not willing to uh 
use the interventionists. I have like a couple that I use that are really, really good. Um, obviously treat, there's tons of treatment out there for, you know, insurance, cash, free places. Uh, I have you no know, every resource from here to Baltimore where I'm at now. Um, and then, you know, I, uh, I'm just always like, I'll talk to anyone, you know, any time of the day, obviously I, I have kids too. And so I can relate a little bit on, on that part for the parents. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm like huge into like education. I'm huge into obviously the parents getting into Al-Anon and, and finding recovery for themselves. And then if the client isn't, or the loved one isn't willing, I'm huge on intervention. Um, I like professional referrals just because I think that you can kind of get caught up in some places that aren't great in terms of treatment. Um, I always like to give people, you know, two to three options and then, you know, I'll give them the representative's number for who works there. Um, I'm like big on if the people are local to come over and see the treatment center. Um, you know, obviously I work for a treatment center, but I place a lot of people at other treatment centers just because we're not always the right fit for, um, you know, people who are needing help. And then, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just big on community, you know, like I think, um, especially in our community, uh, a lot of people want to hide it. I'm, I'm big. I do like a sobriety post on my Facebook every year. Obviously, we talked about earlier, like when I had my episode, I got 5150 at Mission Hospital in Laguna when I was 18 at CDM. That was like all in the paper. Um, uh, when I, obviously, I got kicked off the team at UCLA. Everybody knew that. So everybody, you know, in the community kind of knows my story and people will message me on Facebook saying that their loved one or they themselves struggling. And so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm an open book when it comes to it. Sobriety is my life. The only reason I have what I have is because of sobriety and I don't take that for granted ever. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it's a community deal. I don't, I don't ever advise people to take it on alone or try to make the decision themselves, whether to put their, you know, loved one in treatment or not. I, I'm always big on like consulting a professional. Yeah. And I'm always talking to families about the importance of their, their participation, you know, um, early on, and I don't hear this as much anymore, but um, parents would say to me, I don't understand why I need to go to a meeting, or I don't understand why I need to read this book. Sure. I'm not the one doing the drug, or sure. I'm not the one who was arrested for a DUI, or sure. all of the other consequences that happen. And so how do you help, you know, now, now being a, a parent, being a husband, you know, sometimes we're not just talking to parents. Sometimes we're talking to spouses who I think can get just as caught up uh, yeah. in, in the behaviors and in the dysfunction of the family unit. So how are you encouraging them um, to seek their own, their own wellness? Yeah. Well, I talk about like a, like freedom a lot, you know, like my parents, you know, my dad, like, really didn't come from anything. My mom, obviously, she talked about her story, and they both, you know, worked extremely hard to, like, give themselves, you know, this amazing life, and then give us kids, like, our, our, an amazing life. So then here I come along, and then I have my issues, and then essentially, like, they're trapped, you know, and that was for, like, years, for, like, five to seven years, it was like that. And I just tell people, it's like, ultimately you want to live this free life, whether your kid is sober or not. Um, and I tell parents, you know, I, I typically will find out the backstory of their life. And then I just, you know, encourage them to say, and I would have like told my parents the same thing. It's like, look, you guys worked extremely hard to get where you're at now. You guys now, you know, live this beautiful life and you got kids and now they have grandkids. It's like, you don't have to be trapped to do this dance with your son because he's not choosing sobriety he's choosing to go out there and be crazy and and live this reckless life like you don't have to participate in that with him you can go to work and live your own life and obviously draw boundaries to where like you don't have to participate in that behavior even though that's like not, <laughs> being a parent that's like not an easy thing to say to just cut your kid out because you know they're choosing drugs and alcohol over a relationship with you but essentially like 
um, you know, you have to let it, let him or her go. Yeah. And it's important to build those tools, right? Because as you said, whether it's your spouse or whether it's your child, and especially if it's your child, mm -hmm. you know, learning that letting go and learning that there can be happiness and there can be wellness in your family, even if that missing link that mm -hmm. Terry spoke about, you know, you're always going to have a hole in your family when someone isn't well or when we've lost someone. But mm -hmm. in today's world with the fentanyl, the number of yeah. fentanyl overdoses that we're seeing, the number of um, suicides that we're mm -hmm. seeing currently, this is the biggest time of the year for suicide. Right. This is, right. you know, the increase in the overdoses and the deaths are real. And, you know, I'm not someone who tries to scare people into recovery or scare families into decisions. These are just actual facts of today. Sure, sure. And I, and I always tell people, you know, some people go down the rabbit hole a little bit deeper than others. Obviously, like, I blew a lot of chances that I wish I could have taken back at the same time. Like, I blew chances that I understand why I blew them now, you know, because I, I get to help a lot of people with what I've done and what I've been through. And so I always, you know, tell families, it's like, maybe, maybe this is just where they need to be right now. Maybe they need to be out there experiencing um, some, you know, trauma and like all this stuff or whatever they're doing. Obviously that's not ideal for everyone, but maybe this is just where they need to be. So when it's time to get sober, you know, it's, they're ready. So. I think everyone's got their own story and, and, and path. And some people obviously go down the rabbit hole a little bit deeper than others. But I sometimes tell parents, like, maybe this is just where he needs to be right now. So, Terry, would you say the first step is asking for help? And if so, how do you do that? That's a really great question. I wish I could tell you how I got into that Al-Anon meeting and we're tying this all around the holidays. And um, I remember really doubling down at meetings during the holidays and listening to double winner share and what he was talking about, whether they're choosing to stay out or they've just gotten out of treatment. And let's say they are working with a sponsor and they are going to meetings. My disease still wants to get in there and have a say in things. So I would have to be front loaded with my sponsor a meeting on the back end, I would listen to the, the AA guys say, you know, I tell my guys, get in there, do the dishes, take out the trash, and then get to a meeting right in the middle of a Thanksgiving or a Christmas holiday. And I had to be prepared on my end. Oh, look, he's taking out the trash. He's working a program right now. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's loading the dishwasher. He's doing what his sponsor said right now. I need to keep my big mouth shut. And Oh my gosh, he's, he, we go to the movies on Thursdays at night after Thanksgiving. He's got to go to a meeting. He's working a program right now. He's sober. We've all been waiting for this. We got to get on board for this. It gives me the chills because if I didn't know those things, I may have very well come up against any one of those activities that he was trying to work to become sober. Right. Right. So having an exit strategy is important for a loved one seeking early recovery, but having an exit strategy for a family member too. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned earlier, um, stepping into a closet. If you have a house full of, of guests, if you have a house full of family members and things are falling apart or you're falling apart, you know, you reference stepping into a closet and making that call to your safe someone. Yeah. Uh, and giving yourself a moment, whether that's full of tears or not, um, but allowing yourself the grace. You know, I think that's important for family members to hear, allowing each other and allowing yourself the grace to take a moment and to reach out to a safe person and to identify and know who that safe person or who that safe space is prior to walking into those holidays. Right. Yes. And my experience in Al-Anon is that people will just walk up to you and introduce themselves to you. I've had that same experience in open AA meetings. It's, there's really no effort required. And on my side of the street, we are doers and you know we wanna get in there. And, and it was the first place I could just sit down and passively learn 
um, and let people be kind to me. That was probably one of the first places I could do that. Yeah. And, you know, for those who have experienced a meeting or two and said it wasn't a good experience or I didn't like it, I would say to them that you need to shop a meeting just yeah. like you would shop a therapist, just like you, you go to a meeting with a group of friends and say, this group of friends isn't for me. You know, you want to find a meeting that people are in solution. They could be crying. They could be sitting there and doing nothing more than crying together and holding each other's hands, but they're still in solution. There are meetings where people, because they don't know yet how, are staying in the dysfunction. So you may need to go to a few meetings to find that safe space. You may need to shop around, but be willing to do that. And I would say do that before the holidays. Do that before this time comes up so that you have a safe space in your pocket or a safe person. Um, and as Adam said, there's so many professionals in our communities, um, interventionists, case managers, therapists, and having a professional who can coach you through these moments. We do a lot of case management at Hired Power. We do a lot of family coaching, especially now as the holidays approach of what's my next step and, and how do I do this next thing? So it's an important time to be asking for help and figuring out how to ask for help. Um, to your point, there's a lot of shame and guilt. You talk about shopping meetings. Who are you going to see at a meeting? Are you going to hold to their anonymity? Are they going to hold to your anonymity and just resting in, in the hope that they are? Because it's, it, you, I can't explain it. I we were talking about uh, on your DNA and you, you get married and you have kids and your family of origin has done la 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then it starts appearing in your children and your the shame and the guilt in that. How can I walk into any rooms? How can I make a phone call? I'm so flooded with emotion and shame and guilt. How can I move forward in this? Yeah. And addiction is such a generational cycle, right? Yeah. And what's amazing in the Smith family and watching you guys are you are, it's so exciting, kind of tears me up to see Adam as a dad and to see wow. that the generational cycle of addiction and illness is stopping with him. Those baby girls, they don't have to know that. Yep. Mm -hmm. They don't have to feel it or experience it because your family is, is healing. And that doesn't mean perfect. And you still may not have a Christmas card Thanksgiving or a Christmas card Christmas because you're, we're all humans and we're going to have real authentic emotions. And sometimes that's ugly, but the generational cycle gets to stop. And that's so amazing and so powerful. And what a gift Adam is giving to his children and what a gift you have given him in the breaking and being part of that stopping of the generational cycle, because we may be um, predisposed to addiction. You know, Adam's girls are gonna be predisposed to addiction genetically, but they're no longer predetermined to have to suffer that. And that's just magic. And, and when you're first in meetings and you're in so much pain and you talk about gratitude and being grateful, and I would hear that and I would think, God, I just want to be grateful. I have experience. I have strength. I just want hope. I want to be grateful. And to your point, he is a great dad. His wife is a great mom. It is such a treat to get to see them know things that I didn't, I had no idea when I was his same age. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. You mentioned that watching him parent and seeing him use his program in oh. his parenting and, and how that's going to be special for his girls. Oh, it, it's, it's speaking a language that we're all desperate for, but you got to do the heavy lifting. He talked about Joe Kleeman, and Mike uh, Johnson, his sponsors. They were so generous with my husband and I about teaching us the language that's required. And it was like learning how to speak a whole new language. Yeah. Yeah. So if we had some closing tips for entering this holiday season as people in recovery, as family members in recovery, 
what do we want to say to those of us that are listening and trying to learn or or needing who are who are stuck in pain and really suffering? You want to go ahead? Yeah, I would I would just say get into some type of community, whether it's church or um Al Anon or AA. Um you know, if you're really, really serious, I would say like hire an interventionist or um you know case management team or start talking to a professional just to get the ball rolling. Cause really you're just kind of I always say like putting a, a band-aid on a shotgun shotgun wound. You're just you're just uh delaying the inevitable. And so um yeah, I would say get into a community, start talking to a professional and um, you know, do it before it's too late. Yeah. And I would say, um, stop being judgy judge Steen of the judge parade. It doesn't have to be like it's always been those traditions that we've always done. I told you the funny story about Adam said he went to move his, he was going to move his car and he drove away one. Tell, tell us that story. Tell us that Easter story. <laughs> he sets out all the Easter eggs. He's being super helpful people get sick no one's showing up it's my husband and his mom at the table and he says he's going to move his car and he's gone (laughs) (laughs) i'm i'm pretty much knowing what's happening and i say i text him and i said hey i think i know what happened here next time could you say hey i'm gonna go and go now this isn't this isn't what i need to be doing right now which means drive your own car and be willing to have things go differently than you had hoped. Expectations are um, like a gun to the head of a person trying to stay sober. They just are. Yeah. Do you remember that Easter, Adam? Yeah, it's a, I talk about like growing up the last 11 years. I just, uh, you know, it's just very hard for me to, uh, express things you know in like early sobriety it's just you know you're so uh, you're so impulsive I took that from using well into my sobriety um my impulsiveness and so yeah my brain would just be like you're uncomfortable you should get out of here and I'd be like later (laughs) I did that multiple times well and it and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you needed to get into a safe space whether yeah. and I don't mean a physically obviously your parents are a physically safe space but an emotionally safe space yeah that you you've got to give yourself that allowance and as your mom said maybe maybe learn to give them a heads up right yeah yeah and, and I always had a plan I think for someone who's in early sobriety or even like now like I just always had a plan like I always I want to say I went to a meeting like every Christmas day or I went to a meeting every Christmas Eve for years, like all the way up until probably like the last two or three years, um, just because, you know, nothing bad about my family, but like just being around family in that type of environment, um, it brings up a lot of emotions, you know, of like failures. And you know, like, as a kid, you start judging yourself on like what your siblings are achieving, like they own houses and this and that, and like all this stuff. So you um, it's, it's very hard to not do that as like a sober individual, especially like, you know, when you like drop out of school and everything kind of like gets pushed back, um, as like a sober individual, you start and you you don't know you're going to do that until you're in the situation. So I always had a plan, like always called my sponsor before I was going to a meeting, like right after I was calling my sponsor, right after I was calling my little white picket fence of guys that I had. Um, and so like, by the time I left that and I had all those emotions, um, I was like processing it with three other guys and then asking them about their day, how it went. And then I wasn't even thinking about myself. And then my dad and I, we went to Charlie street for like a good number of years on Thanksgiving day. Like, uh, you know, that was something I included my dad in, um, because you know my dad isn't in recovery recovery or anything but we would go to charlie street before we went to uh we went to my parents house for thanksgiving and we loved that you know and i would introduce him to all my friends that were in recovery and you know charlie street on thanksgiving is like insane there's so many people there and 
And, um, you know, that was something we did for, for a lot of years to kind of help our dynamic that we had going on. So that segues into a great topic, a great way to wrap this up, being of service, right? Mm -hmm. Being of service to others in this very highly emotionally charged and difficult season and time of year. So, you know, you just put a, a, a very magical point of if you're not feeling well, if things are rough for you, getting out of yourself and being service to others, being present for others sometimes helps pull you through those tough moments, those tough times, takes you out of yourself. So that's a, that's a great segue, remembering to be of service this holiday season to others. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was in Chico's house, there was like talks of me going back for the holidays. And uh, we were like coming up with a plan. And he was like, I want you to cook your family a meal. And I was like, so uncomfortable at the thought of that. I just had never <laughs> done anything like that. I was so far yeah. out of my comfort zone. But yeah, I mean, now it's like we try to buy the food whenever we can. We try to, because obviously we come over with all the kids and we just tear up my parents' house. And um, <laughs> we just try to, you know, help clean up and um, just be of service and, you know, have them relax a little bit. But yeah, um, that's what my sponsor told me. He's like, take out the trash, wash the dishes, just like be busy so you're not. And that's what I would tell people because like, just don't be in your head and get, just get to work like start picking um people's plates off the table and just help out instead of just sitting in the corner and being in your head it's a great tip i think it's probably going to be the most valuable tip going in so i know that risa we've got a, a list of 10 tips for the holidays um terry didn't really touch on this but um when adam came home originally from treatment her therapist asked them to maintain a dry household and that's a hard thing to ask on the holidays. But if you or your family really can't step away from a glass of wine, you may also want to ask yourself why at that moment. So maintaining a dry household, staying connected to your support and recovery community. We talked about having a phone number of a support person with you. Don't wait till you're in crisis to de determine who that person is. Have an exit strategy. And Adam just said, be kind to yourself, you know, give yourself some grace. This is hard times. Have realistic holiday expectations, be of service to others, avoid known risks. If you know a house isn't where you should be hanging out, don't go there. Um, bring your own safe drinks. If you're attending an event or a holiday event at work or with friends and avoid hot topics, right? Nothing is worse. <laughs> than getting into hot topics with families. How should you parent your children? Old family fights, politics, you know, community events. Stay away. Stay away <laughs> from it all. I'm going to so, take that one. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've, we've covered that, but thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having both of you. I really honor the work that both of you do in the community, the way you make yourselves available. I mean, Terry calls me all the time. I have a mom who needs you. I have a family who needs you. And, and without you, Terry, they wouldn't get to us. So I just honor and really value both of you and the journey. And it's been a beautiful journey to watch. And I'm grateful for your friendships. Thank you, guys. Privilege. Yes. Thank, Thank you me. all so much for sharing today. This was a wonderful conversation. I really hope for all of you tuning in that the, you took away some valuable information and it made you feel less alone. Um, if there's anything more we can do to help, please reach out to Higher Power. We are available 24-7, 365 days a year. So even if it is on Thanksgiving or whenever it is, we are here to help you. Uh, we know these are tough times coming up and I hope if anyone wants to take a screenshot of these tips, please do. And otherwise, we will be emailing out the recording along with these tips as well this weekend. So hopefully, you might be able to forward it to anyone else who they who might be able to help as well. So thank you so much again, um, Nanette and Terry and Adam for being so vulnerable, vulnerable and sharing your story. And thank you, Nanette, for helping to pull all this together and everything you do. And we're getting some great comments. Everyone saying thank you, guys. Awesome presentation. So thank you so much for taking the time. I really hope we're able to help some people today. Thank you, Risa. Thank you. Thank you Bye, guys. guys. Bye. Much love. Bye. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays.
Bye.